Hello and welcome to week one, part one of EGM 703, Principles of Thermal Remote Sensing. In this lesson, we'll recover the basics of electromagnetic radiation, the main tool we use to gather information in thermal remote sensing. In the rest of the lessons for this week, we'll cover even more principles of thermal remote sensing, thermal properties of objects, how to convert radiance to temperature, atmospheric correction, and finally, applications of thermal remote sensing. As you should hopefully remember from previous modules on remote sensing, the light that we see is a type of electromagnetic radiation. For most remote sensing, we use electromagnetic radiation to observe things. But how should we think about or picture light or electromagnetic radiation? Note that in this lesson, I'm going to be using light and electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation interchangeably, and we'll learn why that is a bit later. Over time, physicists developed two main theories for how light behaved, the particle model and the wave model, based on different phenomena or properties they observed. So, is light a particle or is it a wave? The table to the right here lists some of the different phenomena that scientists have observed and indicates which of the two models can be used to explain each one. Both models can explain reflection and refraction, but only the wave model can explain the properties of interference, diffraction, and polarization. But the wave model can't explain the photoelectric effect, see the additional resources at the end of this lesson, whereas the particle model can. So the answer to the question is light a particle or is it a wave is it depends the reason why is well outside of the scope of this course but if you're interested there are more links at the end of the presentation that go a bit deeper into the topic electromagnetic radiation is a self-propagating wave by self-propagating we mean that unlike water waves or sound waves electromagnetic waves travel through space without any external influence as the name suggests, electromagnetic waves have both an electric component and a magnetic component. One of the major lessons of 19th century physics is that a changing electric field induces a magnetic field and vice versa. This is the principle behind, principle behind among other things, induction stovetops and electric motors. So an electromagnetic wave moving through space has both an electric and a magnetic component, usually denoted E and B respectively. The electric component is moving and oscillating in one plane, in this example, the XZ plane, while the magnetic component moves and oscillates in a plane at a 90 degree angle, in this example, the XY plane. Like any other wave, an electromagnetic wave has different attributes or properties. It propagates at a certain speed, usually denoted C. In a vacuum, the speed of light is about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, in other materials, such as Earth's atmosphere, it drops by about 90 kilometers per second. It's only about 0.03% slower. We can also define the wavelength of an electromagnetic wave as the distance between one full cycle. This can be measured between successive peaks, as shown here, or between successive troughs, or the distance between points where the electric component is zero. Another important property is the frequency usually denoted F, of the wave. This is the amount of time it takes to go through a single cycle. The wavelength and frequency are both related to the speed of the wave according to this equation here. The speed of the wave is just the wavelength times the frequency. Other properties of electromagnetic waves include the phase or the fraction of a cycle. As you might have guessed, this is usually defined between 0 and 2 pi, or 0 and 360 degrees. Finally, we have the amplitude, which is the height of the peak, or the depth of the trough, and this is associated with the brightness or intensity of the light. The table here lists the different components and their respective units. There is more to cover about the wave model, and we will return to this in week 3 when we look at microwave remote sensing. Remember that I said light can behave as both a particle and a wave. We've seen how we can describe light as a wave, and now we'll take a look at the particle model. In this model, light is a particle, called a photon, that has a particular energy that we normally denote Q. 
Another of the big discoveries of 19th and early 20th century physics is that objects, which is to say atoms, can only absorb and emit energy in discrete units called quanta. And if you're wondering, yes, this is where we get the term quantum mechanics. So the amount of energy, then, that a photon has is directly related to its frequency by a constant known as Planck's constant. Using what we know about the relationship between the frequency and wavelength of light, we can rewrite this using the equation at the bottom of the slide here, with this table showing the units of the different variables that we have on this slide. So the energy contained in a photon is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Put slightly differently, longer wavelengths mean lower frequencies mean lower energy. And conversely, shorter wavelengths mean higher frequencies mean higher energy. For remote sensing, this also means that longer wavelengths are harder to detect. We need more photons at lower energies to strike our sensor in order to register a signal when compared to higher energy photons. This is a fact that we will keep coming back to as we look more at thermal remote sensing. It's one of the reasons why, for example, we don't see high resolution thermal sensors. All matter that has a temperature above zero Kelvin or minus 273.15 degrees Celsius emits electromagnetic radiation. The amount of radiation that is emitted, also called the radiant emittance, strongly depends on the temperature. For an idealized body, or for an idealized object called a black body that perfectly absorbs and re-emits all of the energy that falls on it, the radiant emittance is directly proportional to its temperature raised to the fourth power. The first equation shown here is known as the Stefan-Boltzmann law. So, relatively small increases in temperature lead to very large increases in radiant emittance. In reality, most objects aren't perfect black bodies. Instead, they emit some small fraction or some fraction of the electromagnetic radiation that a black body does. We can measure how well an object approximates a perfect black body by its emissivity which is defined as the ratio of its emittance to that of a black body with the same temperature. And again, we have a little table here showing the different units for the variables shown on the slide. Starting to put all of this together, we see that objects with higher temperature have higher energy, and the electromagnetic radiation they emit will have a higher frequency or a shorter wavelength. This also means that the color of electromagnetic radiation that an object emits changes as well. The plot here shows how an object's radiance, the amount of energy that's emitted by the object, varies with both wavelength and temperature. Note, this, note that this is a semi-logarithmic plot. The steps on the y-axis represent an increase of 1,000, while the steps on the x-axis go from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, and so on. Cooler objects, shown as darker lines on the plot, have a lower overall radiance, and the wavelengths they emit most at are much longer. As we increase in temperature, we also increase the overall radiance. The peak gets higher and higher, and we shift the peak of the curve toward lower wavelengths. In space, our sun appears mostly white because it emits fairly evenly across the wavelengths that we can see with our eyes. Even our atmosphere changes this slightly. Wood fires, with a temperature of around 1500 Kelvin, appear mostly reddish-orange to our eyes, while the human body, at about 300 Kelvin, doesn't really emit at all in the wavelengths that our eyes can see. We can calculate the dominant wavelength that an object emits at, which is to say the color of its maximum radiance, using something called Wien's displacement law. I think we've had plenty of equations already in this lesson, so that's one for you to look up later. As we've seen, electromagnetic radiation comes in a large range of possible wavelengths or frequencies, which we call the electromagnetic spectrum. 
we can somewhat arbitrarily divide the spectrum into regions of wavelengths with similar enough properties. As you can see here, the light that we see with our eyes, known as visible light or visible electromagnetic radiation, makes up a very small portion of the overall electromagnetic spectrum, with wavelengths between about 400 and 700 nanometers. Just below visible light, we have ultraviolet light, with wavelengths between about 10 and 400 nanometers. Above the visible spectrum, we have infrared infrared light, followed by microwaves and then radio waves, which can have wavelengths over several kilometers in length. Each of these different regions has its own properties that we can use to study different things. As shown on the previous slide, the thermal infrared roughly covers the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum between about 3,000 and 35,000 nanometers, or 3 to 35 micrometers. Within this region of the electromagnetic spectrum, there are three atmospheric windows. An atmospheric window is a region where the atmospheric transmission, or the percentage of radiation that the atmosphere lets through, is rather high, which usually means that satellites can actually observe these wavelengths. The first of these windows, between about 3,000 and 5,000 nanometers, overlaps with the reflected solar radiation. There are some sensors that record in this range, and we'll cover those a bit later this week. The second window, from 17,000 to 25,000 nanometers, is not typically used for remote sensing. This is partly because longer wavelengths are harder to detect, but also because this window has a lot of, a lot of absorption bands. This is areas where the atmosphere is essentially opaque to radiation. Finally, we have the window between 8,000 and 14,000 nanometers, and this is the one that we most commonly use for thermal remote sensing, because aside from the ozone absorption band at about 9,600 nanometers, atmospheric transmission is generally uniformly high in this region. This region also overlaps very nicely with the peak of the Earth's emitted radiation, meaning that we can use this region to estimate the temperature of Earth's surface. As we've seen, electromagnetic radiation, or light, has the properties of both a wave and a particle, which is only a small part of what makes our universe such a strange and wonderful place. The energy of electromagnetic radiation depends on its wavelength or frequency. Higher wavelengths or lower frequencies mean less energy, and vice versa. All objects with a temperature over absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin, emit electromagnetic radiation the amount of which and color of which depends on the temperature. Finally, we can think of electromagnetic radiation as existing on a spectrum of wavelengths or frequencies and divide these up depending on their properties. The thermal infrared, which we will be covering this week, is usually considered to be the region between 3,000 and 35,000 nanometers, give or take. When we're doing thermal remote sensing, especially from satellites, we typically use the region between 8,000 and 14,000 nanometers because this represents both a strong atmospheric window and the peak of Earth's emitted radiation. You can read more about the topics that we've discussed here in the two textbooks, Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, chapters 1, 4.8 to 4.11, or Campbell and Wynn, chapters 2 and 9 or you can read more about it from the Natural Resources Canada Remote Sensing Tutorials linked here. I've also included links that cover some of the extra topics that we didn't get into, like the photoelectric effect and the ultraviolet catastrophe, which goes into some more details about blackbody radiation and the history of its study. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!